So let's now turn and, and get into uh, PV. And uh, Rami, I'm going to turn to you to talk about some of the signs and symptoms these patients um, present with and the uh, initial clinical workup that we should be doing. Right. So I think with polycythemia vera particularly, the initial presentation can you know, be very variable. Uh, I have to say nowadays probably half of the patients are found to have erythrocytosis on routine you know, CBC checkup by the primary care doctors, and they get referred to us based on that. There are symptoms related to the erythrocytosis that can, patients can present with, such as like headache, uh, aches, uh, double vision. They are really nonspecific symptoms. Uh, <clears throat> pruritus, uh, some of the constitutional symptoms we see with myeloproliferative diseases. Unfortunately, there is still a subset of patients that their initial presentation is a thrombotic event, whether it's arterial or venous uh, event with P-Vera. And, you know, the initial workup, had become a little bit easier in a way with all those molecular testing, but it's always the task of distinguishing a primary polycythemia vera from secondary erythrocytosis causes. We still see some challenging cases that, you know, all the molecular testing is negative for those patients, and we don't know if we can label them as P. vera. But, you know, with the availability of testing for the JAK2 mutation, I think 95% of the patients or more would have the mutation. That's an objective way to tell us that this is a primary polycythemia. Uh, so <clears throat> when we see those patients, obviously the workup will include, you know, their blood counts, uh, looking at the mutations again, like assessing for the JAK2 mutation. Um, I still do bone marrows on those patients as a baseline, personally, uh, partly because I think down the road, if there are clinical changes, one would like to have a baseline. Uh, in diseases such, you know, ET and myelofibrosis, I think it's important to try to distinguish a prefibrotic MF from ET. Even in polycythemia vera, there is a subset of patients that could have some fibrosis in the bone marrow at the beginning that those patients are probably more likely to progress to myelofibrosis. Uh, it may not be needed for diagnosis, as you mentioned, because if you have, you know, erythrocytosis, a JAK2 mutation in the peripheral blood, you could make the diagnosis. But I think there is still value of doing the bone marrow. In terms of the risk assessment, I think we've, for many years, looked at the risk assessment in terms of risk of thrombotic events. So we look at, you know, uh, traditional risk factors such as, you know, age and presence of prior event, whether the patients had like a stroke or MI or like DVT. So those patients that are above age of 60 or they had an event, we consider them as a higher risk and we tailor the treatment based on that. I think we've learned a little bit more in terms of risk assessment that there are other variables that are important, such as, for example, leukocytosis uh, that could be predictive of outcome in those patients, uh, whether it's risk of thrombotic events or prognosis in general or progress, uh, progression of the disease. Uh, the, the, the mutations we see, for example, the uh, variant allele frequency of the JAK2 mutation, you know, in patients with P-Vera, those that have homozygotic mutation will may be at higher risk of progression to myelofibrosis. Uh, certain mutations such as IDH1, IDH2 can predict progression to leukemias. So I think we are becoming a little more sophisticated. Uh, tailoring the treatment is still based on the traditional risk factors for clotting, but I think there are several other factors that we have to consider when we uh, assess the risk for those patients. So so Rami, 95% of patients with PV will have a JAK2 V617F and most of the remaining patients in exon 12. Um, but we also know that the fourth most common mutation in clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate prognosis can be a JAK2 mutation. Does allelic frequency help you in distinguishing chip from true PV? Do we use this at all? I, I think it, it does because like in most of the patients with PV, the variant allele frequency will be at a higher level than what you expect to see with chip because typically with chip, you know, it's the, the VAF is usually in the 10 to 20 percent range and also absence of other mutations. So in, in in CHIP, you are not supposed to see, for example, a JAK2 and TET2 mutation, right? So if there are a couple of mutations, those will tell you more that this is probably not CHIP. But I think the, the VAF could be helpful. 